Arizona and New Mexico could be shaved off at the bottom. And we could have a state called Forgotonia. What do they all have in common? Yep. Holy crap! <laughs> they got their shapes through transportation. Everybody buckle up. It's going to be a bumpy ride. It's the history hidden in our map. How the states got their shapes. In this episode, the Great Plains, Trains, and Automobiles. In a nation as vast as the United States, getting from state to state has never been simple. So every era has developed its own favorite way of getting around. As the types of transportation changed, so did the shapes of our states, from rivers to canals, from railways to highways. This history is hidden right on the map. And it all starts with riverboats. In the early 1800s, when our country was just starting out, rivers were the first highways and drew many of our state's borders, like Illinois. In fact, Illinois would have gotten a different shape if it weren't for the mighty Mississippi. Any state that bordered this superhighway was sitting pretty. A northern state like Illinois could ship goods as far south as Louisiana. And the story of how Illinois got its shape begins with that interstate connection to the Mississippi. We're going to name all the states that border the Mississippi River. Lord okay. have mercy. <laughs> That's not one of them. <laughs> Lord have mercy is not one of them. That is correct. Louisiana. Mississippi. Correct. Arkansas. Arkansas. Tennessee and Kentucky. Illinois. Missouri. How many was that? Is anyone counting? We have three more. Iowa. It's famous for its cheese. Wisconsin. <laughs> Minnesota. Mm -hmm. That's 10. You're missing the 11th. I thought there was just 10. There are. Just, just, <laughs> okay. just, just nice work. <laughs> the Mississippi is the main highway to a bigger river system. It eventually drains 31 states, thanks to the rivers that feed it, like the Illinois. But today, that connection is causing a big problem for the Great Lakes states, and Illinois is taking the heat. Why? It's all because of a pesky jumping fish called the Asian carp. Heard about the problems with the Asian carp? Yes. Some type of carp, some fish, is making its way into the into uh, Lake Michigan. The Asian carp has actually taken over quite a few lakes up in the Midwest. What I've also heard is that they'll jump into your boat if you're out on Lake Michigan. No, I don't believe That's you. That's what I've heard. I don't I'm telling you. you. I'm not if you're on the canoe, I've been around the block right a few in. times, and I've never heard of these jumping. Well, fish. I'm telling you. I believe that's the one that jumps out of the water and jumps into boats. <laughs> Are you telling me that if I were to get into a boat in one of these canals downstate in Illinois, the fish would literally jump into my boat? An Asian carp, I've heard they jump in a boat. OK, I've got to see these flying fish for myself. So I'm headed to Bath, Illinois, on the Illinois River. It's ground zero in the fight against the carp invasion. Now, do you remember a time when this wasn't the case here? Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, 10 years ago, you didn't have any kind of worries about this type of thing. You had your normal fish. You had your catfish, your carp, and uh, your bluegill and your crappie. You ever uh, see any of those fish anymore? I uh, hardly ever see the bluegill and crappie anymore. Can you eat them? I mean, can you just? Uh, I wouldn't eat one. Wanna... <laughs> They're slimy. They stink. Um, so it's pretty disgusting. Yes, yeah, very You have a, sh a fish that is a nuisance. It's flying, it's overpopulated, and it's inedible. It's almost like a curse. Yes. It would be great if somebody could come up with something to get rid of them. The Asian carp got into the Mississippi River during the floods of the 90s when they cut loose from fish farms down south. 
They journeyed north on the Mississippi and are now making their way up the Illinois River. Now, is this thing going to do me any good to really have it? <laughs> we arrive there not knowing what to expect. And we think that most of the, the description of the Asian carp is just an exaggeration. We're getting ready. It turns out that, no, they're not kidding. These fish are absolutely terrifying. We just left, literally, literally just left. And they are jumping everywhere around us. Yep. Holy crap. Look at that. Them guys are going to get slimed. They are. Kenny, don't let us get slimed. I'm afraid there's no chance that I can stop that from happening. The sound of the boat cutting through the water drives these fish absolutely mad, crazy. Turns them into these little berserk sea creatures that jump out of the water and fly at you. They're actively, I believe, trying to kill us. This is not fishing. This is more like projectiles coming out of nowhere, just firing at you. So what do Asian carp have to do with the shape of Illinois? Well, the answer lies in where these fish are headed to a man-made canal that changed history and put Chicago on the map. Will you draw for me your Illinois? I'll give it a shot. The actual state? OK. What forms the western border of Illinois? Uh, the Mississippi. That's correct. You left this little area right here. Like, That's Lake Michigan. What city then became a thriving metropolis? Chicago. Sure. Cook County. Cook County. Cook County. What built Chicago into a great American city? Well, a lot of people think it was that. But really, it all started with this. Chicago's first canal was the economic engine that gave the city its start. Today, the fish are headed to its successor, and that's a big problem. If the Asian carp pass through these locks, they'll get into the Great Lakes and ruin a $7 billion fishing industry. But the threat wouldn't exist if Illinois had kept its original shape. Back then, the canal wasn't here. And Chicago looked like this. The setting that we're standing at right now, in the way this configuration is with the creek and then the lake here, how is that significant? Well, what you're seeing here is what the city of Chicago would have looked like if you'd come here with the first French explorers in 1673. You'd see a little river connecting to Lake Michigan. That's not a big thing, but here's the deal. Lake Michigan connects the rest of the Great Lakes, connects the St. Lawrence River, connects the Atlantic Ocean. So you can get here by boat from the Atlantic Ocean. How did they know that, you know, Eureka, we found the real uh, transportation route to the Atlantic. When the French explorers came here, the Indians told them, when you want to get back to Canada, the best way to do it is go up this little river, portage your canoe a very short distance through a kind of muddy swamp with some smelly plants they called Chicago, and you're in Lake Michigan. And from then on, it's water all the way back to Canada. But the hot spot that became Chicago wasn't always in Illinois. In fact, Illinois had to fight for it. 1817, the territory of Illinois applies for statehood. At this point, its northern border falls south of Lake Michigan. But Illinois settlers have big plans. They make a play to shift the border north, where the Chicago River connects to Lake Michigan. They know that if they can build a canal to link Lake Michigan to the Mississippi, their state will become an economic powerhouse at the crossroads of a new expanded America. The river tr transportation from the center of Illinois north could all get diverted to the Chicago River, Lake Michigan, through the Great Lakes to the Erie Canal, the Hudson River, the Atlantic. Illinois gets its way with Congress but for a darker reason as well. 
Even in 1817, northern states already fear the coming battle over slavery. As you can see, Illinois extends deep into southern territory and its rivers flow south to the Mississippi. A canal connecting the Mississippi to the Great Lakes would keep Illinois securely fastened to the north. The boundaries of Illinois were very, very much attuned to this conflict over slavery and whether the country would eventually divide. In 1825, the Erie Canal opens, further tying Illinois to the north. Goods can now be shipped from New York City all the way to Chicago. By 1850, some 3,000 miles of canals transport goods all around the country on a vast interconnected network linking the Atlantic Ocean to the Great Lakes to the Mississippi. And that's why Illinois Canal is the linchpin even today and how transportation changed the shape of Illinois. So what's the carp connection? Well, the jumping fish are threatening the canal that created Chicago and reshaped Illinois. Coming up, railways overtake waterways and redraw the map. Better suited for our two-year-old. It's right. called Name That State. It involves just basically looking at a state. Mm -hmm. You can actually mm -hmm. touch it and feel it, turn it around, just feel the weight of it, and then you have to tell me what state that is. It's very right. simple. Are you ready okay. for your first state? Yes. OK, this is your first state. OK, it goes just like that. Or does it? Or does it go like this? Or does it go like that? I think it goes like this. OK. Can I have a hint? Uh, where are you from? Ohio. You're from Ohio, so it's near you. Is it Michigan? Nope. No? And what state is that? Arizona. <laughs> it's oh, a, Illinois. That is correct. It's like that. Yeah. That's correct. That is Illinois, right there. <laughs> it's Arizona. Yeah. It is. I think that you're so cute. <laughs> It can be whatever state you want it to okay. be. Okay, what this state is, is it? This is Arizona. <laughs> Arizona. <laughs> so we've seen how waterways changed the map. But what was the only state to be shaped primarily by shipping interests? Our last state was created out of a scattered group of Pacific Islands. The Hawaiian Islands provided the stopover to support and protect American commerce in the Pacific. From the earliest history, water was the best way to travel. But in Illinois and all across the United States, the mid-1800s saw a new method of transportation. Are you familiar with the board game Monopoly? Yes. OK. On the board, on the Monopoly board game, there are four railroads. Mm -hmm. Can you name the four railroads that are on the Monopoly board? No way. <laughs> it's been too long since I've played it. Pennsylvania. Reading. Reading, Reading. 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 That's right. Yeah. Yes. Man, put me on the spot now. I should know these. Uh, the short line. The short line. The short line. The, the... No, it's called the short line. The short line? It's literally it's called, called the short, the short line. line railroad? Yes, it is. Yeah. Short line. See, it's short. It's not meant to be remembered. There's the B&O one, which I always thought was funny, because it's B-O. Right. I believe one's B&O. B&O. You just thought it meant body odor. Right, exactly. When you think of the birthplace of America's railroads, you might picture Chicago or even New York. What about Baltimore? Unlike New York, Baltimore didn't have canals to ship people and goods to the west. So to compete for access, the city chartered the Baltimore and Ohio, or B&O, railroad in 1827. American train travel was born, and like canals, railroads would help shape our states. Where on the map do you think most of our trains connect? New York. L.A. Philadelphia. Obviously, Chicago. Chicago. So everybody is feeding everybody, right? Kind of, is that right? Yes. Today, our map is covered by more than 130,000 miles of train track. One look and you can see where railroads converged 
and helped create today's big cities. Places like Kansas City and St. Louis are major rail centers. But it's Chicago that reigns supreme as the train traffic hub of the country. Chicago is a transition between the old water city and the new railroad city because it's where the Great Lakes meet the Great Plains. And it's both a seaport, a lake port, and a rail head. Chicago's Belt Railway runs the largest switching terminal in the U.S., yet it's mysteriously empty of people. So I'm not a railroad expert. In simplest terms, what's going on here? Well, basically, we're a distribution center. The Belt Railway of Chicago deals with 14 different railroads, and those railroads all bring trains in. How many cars come through here? 3,000 cars a day go over that hump. This is where the magic happens. They call it the hump, a small hill where rail cars are separated, sorted, and redirected for cross-country departure. The rail yard in Chicago is so expansive, it is so big, it's amazing, and yet still there's one individual out there by hand pulling pins, they call it, and sending individual train cars over the hump, a small hill, that gravity then forces down the rail, and then they meet up with the trains that have been designated by a computer. So how come it takes only one person to run the hump? This is from the future. Yes. This is like yes. incredible that you can control a locomotive with this PlayStation type device. This car might be going to Chattanooga or something. It's got to go on a certain track. All right, here we go. We're going to start her back up. All right. This is just pulling a pin on the car. OK. I'm looking at this board, and there's an arrow. That arrow actually tells you to pull that pin. And you'll see the next car, there's another arrow, but on the next one, you don't see it. So that means a pull two pegs. Do you understand that? Can I don't understand any of that, well, Jack. That's kind of complicated. I only, yeah, it's almost like a different language over there on that side. All right, now you tell me when. Right now is a good time. OK. Well, a little more. Well, up here. Wow, that's hard. Wait. Did I get it? You just don't pull up like you're pulled. Sometimes you might have to wiggle it a little bit. Like everything else, it's you got to have the right touch. Right, and patience. All right. If it don't come, kind of wiggle it. You got it that time. See it? Hey, I'm no longer a virgin. Today's rail yards are yesterday's transportation hubs, the shipping centers that changed the map. So what's the link to covered wagons? As our country spread west of the Mississippi, railroads carried new waves of settlers. Crossing the plains by train was cheaper and faster than traveling by covered wagon. Wagon trains ultimately vanished. But many say they left a lasting mark on today's railways. Supposedly, the standard width between the rails is the same distance between the old covered wagon wheels, 56 and a half inches. Chicago has been the nation's largest hub for railway transit for well over a century. But what I want to know is this. What do trains have to do with time zones? Coming up, train travel warps time and space across the map and reshapes the Southwest. And that is what? A map. That is correct. If you would please show me the time zones in the United States. Oh, it's not going to cost me anything, is it? Not at all. Oh, that'd be tricky. Well, there's an Eastern time zone. That's correct. Follow the Appalachians and play the Smokies. In it. Very nice. Hmm. And then, of course, we're Central. We have the mountain. And then that's the Pacific time. I think so. It, it kind of comes down in. Uh, I didn't do it right, but, you know, I, I, something like that. When traveling across the country, we take the time zones for granted. But keeping time wasn't always so simple.
Up until the 1880s, there was no such thing as a time zone. Most cities and towns set their clocks to the sun. Some places used time balls to regulate local time, lowering a large ball from a high mast every day to mark official noon. Sound familiar? That's the source of the ball in Times Square that drops annually to mark the new year. But time balls didn't help synchronize time between towns. Back then, there were as many time zones as there were cities. It was chaos for an increasingly powerful industry. So in 1883, the mighty railroads changed time. They drew up the four time zones so trains could stay on schedule and carved our country into brand new shapes. Like our states, time zones have their own quirky boundaries. The Eastern Central timeline cuts straight through Tennessee and Kentucky, and then it meanders in and out of Indiana. The Mountain Time Zone claims small pockets of Texas and Kansas, and strangely cuts east-west across Idaho. Why the wiggle room? Economics. In Indiana, Business owners prefer East Coast time to sync themselves with New York. But farmers in western Indiana care less about Wall Street and more about the sun. So 18 counties joined the central time zone, which more closely follows the sun's path. Just like states, time zones can have border problems. Imagine living in one time zone and working in another. Here atop the Hoover Dam, one can stand in two states. My right foot is in the state of Nevada. My left foot is in the state of Arizona. It also sits on the border of two time zones. And so if I step over here, I have to adjust my watch. Luckily, there are two clocks here to clear up the confusion. Do you know what state you're standing in right now? Probably Nevada, but it could be Arizona. I'm not sure. You're also in two time zones. You know that? Ah, I did not know that. OK. Do you know which time zones uh, those are? Pacific and Mountain? That's right. Except for when what? Uh, daylight savings. Right. I'm not pulling the wall over your eye at all about anything. If you're from Florida, what time zone are you in? Well, where I live, uh, we're in the eastern time zone. And what's the other time zone? We go over the panhandle, you're in the central time zone, our difference. And you're standing in? Right now I'm in, uh, let's see, this would be Pacific time zone. And if you crossed over the Hoover Dam on the other side, you'd be in? Mountain time zone. Except during? Daylight savings time. A oh. plus. Wow. A plus. <laughs> wow. So Richard, we, we travel the entire country looking for someone who works in two time zones. You yes. work physically on the border between mountain and Pacific time zone. Does that wreak havoc on your life? If you think about it sometimes, yeah. <laughs> what time do you go by? Always Pacific standard time. Always, always. Pacific. So right. when you work on the Hoover Dam, you go by Pacific exactly. standard time. Because our main headquarters is in Boulder City, Nevada. And since it's in Boulder City, that's where we're set on Pacific Standard Time. OK. When you're late to work, can you ever offer up an excuse like, oh, I thought you meant mountain time? Sure, I've tried that once. Did you? Did it, <laughs> it didn't work? work too well, no. <laughs> <laughs> Railroads changed more than time. As they spread west, they shaped our states in many ways. Railroads greatly impacted on state lines because rivers were no longer as necessary, as useful as boundaries. In fact, if you look at the map from east to west, you will see the use of straight lines increasing. And a major reason for that is railroads. Two states owe a big part of their shapes to railways, Arizona and New Mexico. Their southern borders could have looked like this, if not for a shady deal with Mexico. There was a huge debate as to where the railroads would go. People who lived in the south wanted a rail line from the south to the Pacific coast. People who lived in Chicago in the north wanted a rail line in the north. 1853, 
the northern states hold the lion's share of railways. But the big prize is yet to be won, a railroad spanning the continent. The South maps out a route through territory recently won in the Mexican War, but the only pass through the mountains is still in Mexico. James Gadsden, a wealthy southerner, has a plan. Gadsden, James Gadsden, who made the purchase, was the president of a railroad. And he was the man that the government sent to Mexico to negotiate the purchase of this land. So you very much see a, an interplay between the federal government and big business all the way back in the 1850s. Gadsden buys the land on Uncle Sam's nickel. The Gadsden Purchase forms the southern bulge of what is now Arizona and New Mexico. As it turns out, the Civil War derails the South's dream to control a cross-country railroad. The North beats them to it in 1869. In Utah, engineers drive the golden spike that joins two legs to make the first transcontinental railroad. By the 20th century, railroads had changed time, enlarged our country, shaped several states, and connected our coasts. But within a few years, a new revolution in transportation would roll across America. We've talked about how trains brought the states together. Well, so did cars. Now, 200 years ago, to travel 50 miles, it would take someone, well, three days on foot, about a day on horseback. Nowadays, many Americans travel 50 miles every day just to get to work. While cars gave us the freedom to move around the map, driving also developed a nasty side effect, the traffic jam. This man is actually running faster than I'm driving. Coming up, how cows and clams shaped a city, and why one state gets a bad driving rap. Just let her fly. Just, just let them have it. New York, Washington, D.C. California. If you know how to drive in New York, you drive anywhere. Guess where I live. You live in California. <laughs> Jersey's pretty bad, what with their turnpikes and not being able to pump their own gas. I think I'm a pretty good driver. I'm from Beverly Hills somewhere over. I am not from Beverly Hills, sir. <laughs> Massachusetts, of course. Massachusetts. Massachusetts. <laughs> OK. You think Massachusetts has earned its place as being a, a I think we're a, pretty rude. And you have really confusing roads. Yeah. And so you think then that legitimizes the fact that people from Massachusetts are bad drivers? We're not bad drivers. We have to adapt. You're challenged. We have to adapt to our environment. Canals and railroads shaped many of our states and cities. But when cars hit the road, we had to adapt to our older maps. Case in point, Massachusetts. Boston is known for its crooked streets, its crippling traffic, and its how should I put this mildly? It's crazy drivers. But is this reputation deserved? I'm going to find out. On a street map, Boston looks like a geometric nightmare. There's no orderly grid, just a web of curvy roads that carve the city into crazy shapes. Everybody buckle up. It's going to be a bumpy ride. My adrenaline is already, oh, excuse me. I just ran a red light. Boston is a place that seems almost impossible to navigate. Two separate Hanovers meet in Boston. You not only have to deal with cars and roads that make no sense, but people are darting in and out in front of your car. If Paul Revere had to ride and do his ride today with all the traffic that there is he never would have made it the war could have turned out differently i'm officially lost so i'm going to seek professional help someone who knows these streets like the back of their hand a cab driver
I'm in the back of Larry Meister's cab. He's been driving a cab for 30 years, and he knows why Boston's roads are so darn difficult to drive on. Why do you think the streets are downright mystifying in so many ways, you know? Well, if you go back to folklore, everybody had cows then for milk. But you lived in a little house like this, your cow was in your backyard. So you let your cows out, and they went out to the common grazing ground, which was the Boston Common, to graze for the day, and then they'd come back, and they laid out the roads. So basically, they think the city planners here in Boston were um, livestock. Now, there you go. Right there. That's a typical. Yeah. Now, what do you call that move right there, where it's like, I'm going. He's just gone. Here. Just let him go. Have you ever wanted to get out of your car, though, and just take a baseball bat to someone else's oh, car? Oh, yeah. And I've done it. And, you know, it doesn't, you know, you don't, it, it doesn't pay off. Larry the cab driver has some very important piece of wisdom for anyone who's in uh, Boston driving a car. And that is, just chill out. What do you think of Boston's traffic? Boston drivers, I think, are the worst in the world. Is it the drivers or the roads that contributes it's to It's a the... mix of both. I think it's pretty congested. See, just when you started to say that, a parade started up, the cops started coming, <laughs> and then this van is getting flagged to go backwards. I don't really follow too many road signs, so I kind of just do what I want. We don't care about anything. <laughs> Officer, did you hear that? He just makes up his own traffic rules, That's he right. said, and he does whatever he wants. These streets are designed not for traffic. These are old cow pasture streets. I hear a lot about cows, but I still don't believe they created this traffic nightmare. So many people believe that these streets were carved by cattle and horses. Is that true? I don't think so. I mean, I heard that story when I was a little kid, too. But the earliest path in the city is now called Hanover Street, which you might have seen in the North End. Yeah, we did. Uh, that was a Native American trail uh, that the Native Americans used to get down to the water to gather shellfish, etc. And initially, a lot of the neighborhoods just sprang off of that path like, you know, branches from a tree. So, very, very simple answer then to the question, why is driving so bad in Boston? Is because it wasn't built for cars. Right. It was built for walking. It was built before the car. How would you advise someone coming into Boston if they're going to drive today? Park it and take the tea. <laughs> That's my <laughs> advice. <laughs> so, it was the Indians harvesting shellfish that carved Boston's first pathways. Then why the old wives' tale about cows? Well, it turns out that during the Revolutionary War, the Boston area built a booming cattle trade to feed the rebel troops. They say the first porterhouse steak was served at the Porterhouse Hotel in Cambridge. So the cattle industry built Boston's economy, but it was human feet, not hooves, that drew the city map. And that's how cows and clams helped shape Boston. It's crazy driving and led to the nasty reputation of Massachusetts drivers. The interstate highway system was built mostly in the 1960s and 70s and was yet another revolution in transportation. Now, to get from the Mississippi to the Pacific took Lewis and Clark 13 months for me to make the same journey using the interstate would take about 35 hours. Today, everything in the U.S. seems closer together, all because of transportation. Every generation or two, an invention has changed how we reckon with distance. In the early 1800s, it could take a year or more to travel across the country. By 1830, canals and railroads brought much of the East Coast within a couple days' journey of New York City. Three decades later, you could travel to Chicago in two days, but you still needed at least three weeks and a stagecoach to get to the West Coast. By 1930, trains sped coast to coast in three days, though remote parts of the West still took four. 
Air travel turned days into hours, making virtually every populated part of the country accessible within a day's travel. Today, our interstate highways form the key connections between states. But what happens when the interstate leaves you behind? Walls has the most interstate highways. Uh, Connecticut? I would say California. New Jersey. Illinois. I'm sorry, you're both wrong. Texas. Texas. Correct. Texas? Correct. Texas. Oh, okay, okay, we live there. <laughs> and if I had a prize, I'd give it to you. <laughs> Nearly 50,000 miles of interstate highways sprawl across our country. By far the largest network in the world. One highway, I-90, stretches 3,000 miles, linking Boston to Seattle. Not surprisingly, this system was devised by a military man, President Dwight D. Eisenhower, in 1956. Eisenhower had dreamed of an interstate network since 1919, when he drove across the country in an army convoy. The rough and tumble ride took two months. America's highways were a mess. During World War II, General Eisenhower was impressed by Nazi Germany's Autobahn network. When he became president, he vowed to give America a world-class highway system. Today, we know the interstates as an easy way to road trip across the country. But we take the details for granted, like the numbering system. Highways that run north and south are odd numbered, and those going east and west are even. Interstates with lower numbers are in the south and west, while the higher ones run through the north and east. Today's transportation networks crisscross the entire country and bind us together. But what about the forgotten spaces on the map? The places that our road system has left behind? Highways didn't reshape our states, but they almost carved out a new one, like this lost state. Welcome to Forgotonia a breakaway state that seceded from Illinois and declared war on the United States. So how did Forgottonia get its name? What's the genesis of that? It all started as a publicity stunt. We're just forgotten by the state and federal government, so we ought to just secede. So they did. In the 1960s, when the interstates came through, they bypassed a sizable chunk of western Illinois. Local roads fell apart, businesses dried up, and residents started moving away. So in 1972, several counties shaped their own state and founded the capital in Fandon, a town so remote it even lost its zip code. The uh, people of Forgottonia have been so forgotten, or at least they feel that they have been so forsaken by their, their political leadership, they decided to appoint their own governor. His name is Neil Gam, and he was the governor of what is a shadow government that was in Illinois. And as governor, what responsibilities do you have in Forgottonia? Actually, my job was pretty much over before it began because uh, the whole idea was we had to form an entity that declared war on the government, and then we surrendered. No other countries, no other nations extended a helping hand to you? Not a one. Not even Canada. That was the unkindest cut of all, I think. I would have thought Canada would have helped us some, but they were silent. <laughs> Just damn Canadians. <laughs> <laughs> Neil Gam not only would have my vote as governor if I lived in Forgottonia, I'd run that man for national office. Tell me about where we're standing right now. Well, as near as I can recollect, this is the governor's mansion, and this was by far the finest building in town at the time. Would this have been the guest annex to the governor's I mansion? I met, yeah, governor? this was where the VIPs would stay. Dignitaries from other, would stay other there. states would, yes. would, would stay there. Yes. 
Without help or recognition, Forgottonia abandoned its independence movement. They did get some improvements, though. Recently, a four-lane freeway was extended through western Illinois. But alas, Fandon is still without its own zip code. Do you remember the zip code that once was no, this I place? Don't. In no, Forgo I don't. So you've already forgotten I've the already zip code of Forgotonia. Well, I could just barely find my way here this morning. Really? Yeah. So once again, a new form of transportation changed the states on the map. And in one case, could have created our 51st state. We're a country on the move from waterways to railways to highways. How we get around has changed our map and shaped our history. And the story of transportation is hidden in the shapes of our states. Earth.